I'll be reading from Genesis 17, 1 to 7, and 15 to 16, which is on page 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty, God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations from you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, she, she shall not be, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give her son, give you a son from her. Then I will bless her and, shall, and she will be a mother of nations. King of peoples shall come from her. Amen. The second reading is taken from um, the book of Romans chapter 4. Starting from verse 13 to the end, and it's on page 1131 in the Church Bible. And I read For the promise that he would be the, father, the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to her seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who, were, who are of the law are heirs, therefore, sorry, faith is made void and promise, uh, promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for, there are, there, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of law of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the fa a father of many nations, in the prom in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed so that, they, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his body, his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness, now it was not it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to, to him but also to us but also for us it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered up because of our offense and was raised because of our justification here ends the second reading. The 
fi the final reading is uh, from the Gospel of Mark, and it's on the Church Bibles 10, 12. So 1,012. It's Mark chapter 8, verse 31. So Mark 8, verse 31. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days risen again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in, in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will, will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. begin by saying that these readings that we've heard just now make it clear to us that God is determined to carry out his plan of salvation. He is determined that all nations on earth will be blessed through the offspring of Abraham. God invites you and me and all peoples to join in with this program of the blessing of all peoples on earth. God invites us to join in that same covenant relationship that he had invited Abraham and Sarah to join in. A covenant relationship, a partnership, a deal that struck between two parties to bring about a certain end. And the end is that all peoples on earth will be blessed and come to know the living God whose name is Yahweh. Now, the problem is, I'm sure you will agree to me, is that most of us, most of the time, want to take the easy route towards that future. We want to take and find and take the pain-free way towards that wonderful, wonderful, glorious future that God has prepared for us all and will bring about. So it's quite hard for God to partner with us in his covenant because we're always trying to take the soft option, the easy way to bring about that future. God is, meanwhile, all the time trying to build a people of faith. A people who will believe, even when there seems no reason at all to believe, that God will bless all nations on earth. Abraham, 100 years old, I don't think I know anybody of 100 years old who's ever begotten a child. Abraham, 100 years old, is told he's going to have um, a, a child. Sarai, meanwhile, um, is barren. Her womb is closed, and she's told they're going to have not just one child, but that all nations on earth will be blessed through their offspring, that their offspring will be more numerous than the stars of the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. How can you believe that when you're 100 years old? Very difficult. And your wife has... Uh, never produced a child. But Abraham and Sarah believe this. They believe uh, that God can and will do this. And in, do, in, in the moment they believe it, their names are changed. 
they adopt then Abraham changes to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Sarah, as a kind of way of firming up this faith that is emerging in their hearts that God will do it. Now, Paul, in that reading we heard that Thelma read to us, is actually picking up the same thing. He's saying, look, this is what living faith looks like. It looks like Abraham and Sarah, who believed against all the evidence that they would have a child. Setting your sights on a horizon before you, keeping going even when you can't see that horizon, when it's kind of just not visible because of the, the, the mist or like in the Scottish hills, when it's hidden behind the little hill before you. You can't see it. So faith is, is, is believing you're moving towards that horizon, the horizon of God's future, even when you can't see any evidence that you're ever going to believe it, even that it exists. Jesus then in the gospel tells us that the way forward to the realization of God's promise is going to be tough. It has to be tough. And he tells the 12 that it involves him, Jesus, being arrested and tortured and nailed to a cross. Peter, lead disciple, says, no way, Jesus, I'm not having this. Have you finally lost the plot, Jesus? How on earth can your kingdom be realized on hill on earth if the very thing you've been trying to build up with us for the last few years is about to run into the sand because you're going to be, submit to being, being uh, arrested and convicted. How on earth, Jesus, can that possibly happen? It's crazy. Jesus responds to Peter's objection as though he, Peter, Jesus were speaking to Satan himself. He addresses Peter, get behind me, Satan. He's that angry, he's that determined, he's going to confront Peter with his misunderstanding of what the gospel is. He says that for my father's plan to be fulfilled, I have to go this route to the cross. And what's more, you too, you twelve, are going to have to follow in the same way. There is no other way the plan, the covenantal plan of my father can be fulfilled without me and you following me towards a de death. Left to ourselves, certainly I, this is true for me. I trust it's, suspect it's true for all of us. Left to ourselves, we want to take the path of least resistance. We want to go the pain-free way towards God's future. Now, I want to take two examples now to try to explore how not just individual people want to take the easy way out of this business of becoming a disciple, but actually how whole communities can fall in to taking the easy, pain-free option. I want to talk about Jimmy Savile. I'm sure that you're as shocked as me that over a period of half a century, this man who was a household name was abusing huge, almost incomprehensibly large numbers of children and vulnerable adults. And what's more, it was happening in hospitals across the country, notably Stoke Mandeville Hospital. And what actually shocks me and perhaps shocks you more, more than what Jimmy actually did himself was the fact that the communities in which he was doing these things were turning a blind eye. Staff, colleagues who knew what he was up to were simply not blowing the whistle. None of them, it seems, and this is an indictment on our, our whole generation, none of them had the courage to blow the whistle. I guess 
they must have been too afraid of the consequences. Firstly, if I um, <clears throat> report Jimmy Savile, firstly, they won't believe me. Secondly, it will probably lead to me losing my job. And I guess some of them would probably have felt, we can't do this. This is the best fundraiser we could ever possibly have had. This guy is a genius at raising funds for, our hospi funds for our hospital. It is much more expedient for us just to brush it under the carpet. <clears throat> We've all got our weaknesses. That's Jimmy's weakness. Sometimes it takes just a child to expose, bring out the truth and expose what's happening. And those, of course, who did eventually speak up or speaking up now, left it too late. That's Jimmy Savile. And as I say, I'm with you really shocked looking back over that period of history to the extent to which evil was not brought out into the light. Now, I want us to talk about now another example, and maybe some of you have read the American novel To Kill a Mockingbird. Have any of you read that? Margaret and I read it on, on holiday just now, and um, we're going to see the play, actually, in a week or so's time. Now, the, the essence, the heart of this novel, the heart of this story, set in America, I think it's about the 1930s, we, there is a black man, and the black man is, finds himself invited into the home of a white family home, and the white mother of the home uh, tries to seduce him. She's invited him into the home to do a, 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 just a minor little practical job, I think it's to do, to, to demolish a, a wardrobe she doesn't need anymore. She invites him to come and do that, and as he's climbing up um, on a ladder, she starts to seduce him. <coughs> and uh, the white woman's husband then comes home, and he looks through the window to see what's happening. And he notices that his... Sorry, the man notices that his wife is seducing the black man. She sees what her husband is doing. Sorry, she sees what... Sorry, get it right. Husband who's come home sees what his wife is doing. She's seducing this black man. The white woman notices that husband has come home. She thinks quickly, and she starts to scream and shout. Husband gets the message. She's sending me the message. My wife is sending me the message that I'm being raped by this black man. The black man is put on trial. He is accused of raping this white woman. The evidence that's brought forth by the prosecution is overwhelming that the black man is innocent. His cover up, the cover up story of the white woman simply doesn't hold, can't hold water. And so the whole town actually knows the truth. They all know that this black man who's on trial for rape which Holt carries the death sentence, the whole town knows that he's actually innocent. But the truth for the people of this town is simply too uncomfortable. And the white jury, who of course know the truth, know that the black man is innocent, still return a guilty verdict on the black man, knowing that that will lead to the death penalty, to the electric chair. So we ask the question, why do the jury convict the black man when they know the truth? They convict the black man 
because it is simply unthinkable for them to convict a white man or woman over a black person. The black man has to be guilty because that's their worldview. The whole community then conspires behind this lie. The whole community takes the easy way out. Way, easy way out. They think in doing this, we can keep the peace and keep things as it's always been. But it's a shoddy, rotten, and stinking peace, a phony, fake peace that is achieved. Now, during the trial, there were two children present, I think in the gallery, two white children two white children who happened to be the children, the son and daughter, of the prosecuting attorney. They somehow managed to sneak into the trial and hear all the evidence. And they are the only ones who actually challenge the miscarriage of justice. The only ones who kind of see the truth what it is because all their adults, all their white adults, haven't got the courage to say, hey, hang on a minute, this isn't right, is it? But they have no power, the children, to influence things. And the black man goes, uh, ends up dying, actually, by, because the pressure on him and his family becomes too horrific. He tries to run away and ends up dying on his escape route. And this whole white, this whole town community of black people and white people is fundamentally corrupted by this trial because everybody knows the truth but everybody seems to be wanting to live the lie. And so this fake, phony peace ensues. I won't spoil the whole rest of the story for you because in the end, God gets his way in the most astonishing and extraordinary way. I'd love to tell it to you, but it, it's too... It's too those, are, those of you who've read To Kill a Mockingbird will know that the way it turns around in the end is utterly extraordinary. I commend it to you. Now, my friends, left to our own devices, we too are prone to taking the easy way out. Because we are of the same humanity and weakness of those people of that American town. It's fatal to assume that somehow we, enlightened 21st century English Democrats, are not prone to the, to the weaker side of our human nature. And into this, Jesus says this. He called the crowd to him alongside with his disciples, and he says, whoever wants to... This is, notice it's the whole crowd now, just not just the disciples. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What? good is it for you to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your own soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? If you are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus tells us this because he knows we're prone to taking the easy way out. But if we take the pain-free way, we may end up not just using our life, but even our soul itself. And I think he's saying this not just to individual people, he's saying this to whole community. Watch out in taking the easy way, soft option, you may lose your, collectively lose your soul. Collectively lose your soul. Sometimes, doing the right thing, walking in the way of the cross, can seem crazy. It may appear 
to destroy the very thing that you think you're trying to build up. Abraham, Genesis 22, is called, having conceived her son, Isaac, having conceived him, is called by God to sacrifice him. How crazy can that be? How can I do this? Isaac is my only hope of the fulfilling of your, 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 your covenantal deal with me that all nations on earth will be blessed through my offspring. How, if I stick a knife into my son, how can that possibly happen? But God is calling him to do the crazy thing, the illogical, irrational thing to take the way of the cross. Turning to Jesus, how can the kingdom of the king of kings and lord of lords advance if the king himself ends up nailed to a cross? It's crazy. How can we raise funds for our hospital if dark, the dark secrets of our best fundraiser, the best fundraiser we ever had, are exposed? We won't be able to balance the books. How can we sort out unemployment and poverty in our country if we do not follow Adolf Hitler? He's our best hope. He's our best hope of sorting out our economic and social problems. Look, he's got a problem. He, he's got a bit of a temper. He's a bit manipulative. He's a bit of a control freak. But he's our best hope. We've got to do what Adolf says. Otherwise, we will remain a nation in economic crisis and poverty. How can we keep the peace in our little town if we allow a black man to be set free and we convict a white woman? It is more expedient, the gospel tells us, it is more expedient that one man dies than that the whole nation perishes. Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, innocent of all charges, is led away to be executed in order that the Romans and the Jewish leaders can keep the peace, a phony, fake peace, a peace that actually cannot be kept. But it is more expedient for them, more comfortable, more easy, to do the evil thing of crucifying this innocent man than to have a just trial. But the gospel tells us, Jesus tells us, that in the end, it is only the truth that will set us free. Only the truth will set us free. Any kind of lies or cover-up will keep us in bondage to lies. And the kind of peace that we have, it will be phony, very shallow but as I said at the beginning God will have his way there will be justice for everyone there will be justice for everyone but some may only receive it in the next life this is our faith there will be judgment for some Jimmy Savile there will be judgment but in his case, it will only come after death because nobody blew the whistle. God will carry out his plan and all nations on earth will be blessed through the offspring of Abraham and Philippians 2. Paul writes, every knee will bend and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Meanwhile, here we are on earth in Luton, in Bushmead and every day each one of us has to make decisions small, less small and great and collectively we also have to make decisions temptation for all of us I believe of all communities and all individuals the temptation is to take the easy way out 
the soft option, the comfortable way. But becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, as we have signed up to do, doing, entails taking up our cross and following Jesus wherever it leads us. Betty will lead us in prayer.